so I will talk about studying brain functioning in natural real life situations with auditory attention um, but it's more about the quest to do this uh, and that began with my neuroscience education uh, which was very focused on Tesla Tesla and more Tesla at the time because there were fMRI was the booming thing uh, at my institute and um, I've been in one of those scanners and then I just thought like oh my god it's so unreal uh, and I always had the dream to do more neuroscience about our, our actual lives. Um, so there was of course some EEG but that was usually combined inside the fMRI scanner. Um, so yet as one of the few uh, I chose the EEG direction so to say uh, for my thesis and just a, a fun remark is that when I uh, was googling uh, Belgrade you come again across Tesla, Tesla, Tesla and Tesla. So which is a, a funny link here. Um, so these EG experiments they, they used to go like this uh, and they still go like this um, and um, this is a 256 study I did and um, well, you can imagine uh, that even EEG was not really my dream, um, both as a subject and a researcher. Because, yeah, what about doing this at home or somewhere outside? Uh, I, I still couldn't really see how, it, how it's considered real life uh, that we're investigating. So the magic word was mobile EEG, and for that I was greatly inspired by, uh, yeah, those two papers by uh, Stefan Devener and uh, Martin de Vos um, that already were mentioned in the talks this morning that really established uh, a thing for me like an eye opener of like look there is uh, there are upcoming possibilities that come, came hand in hand with the revolution maybe in hardware to allow for such recordings um, and yeah, it seems very promising and when you read their conclusions in those papers it seems like they're it's already very great to do this so I thought why aren't there like 10 other papers that do these type of things uh, maybe it was too early um, but I thought this is the way to go and I just uh, all these papers they use the oddball task and for that I don't I want to give you the pleasure to experience it just yourself so you know later on I'll refer to that that this is actually the task they're all talking about. So if you focus your attention, you generate a, a slightly different potential that, that's uh, related to, to your attention focus. And um, the idea then was for me to extend uh, this, let's say, core basic concept and, uh, and find some more answers that were posed in those uh, very interesting papers. And for that, it seemed uh, interesting to not investigate it while walking outside but to choose biking um, because on one hand it generates uh, less severe artifacts because you're more steady with your head you, you have less um, out of the gate problems and um, it's also interesting because you go on a slightly faster pace around if you do real world biking compared to walking so actually the differences might be even bigger because you get what much more input while biking and um, Lastly, in Belgium and the Netherlands, where uh, I come from, uh, people used to bike more than walk uh, during a normal day. So those things made up for our, our kind of hypothesis to get this done and then ultimately, hopefully, unravel a bit more about this cognitive effect that was posed that we, we uh, suffer, let's say, uh, of increased cognitive load and that makes us less good at the task at hand. Um, for this, uh, we, we did uh, three outdoor uh, conditions that actually are a bit similar to what Klaus mentioned in the fly study. So at one condition, the subjects, this is all outdoors, they just sit still and they do the task. In the second, they actually pedal, so that's where you basically stick the fly uh, and you generate motor activity. Um, and then the last one is an actual real-life biking tour in which you have these motor uh, uh, activity skills needed and the whole spatial navigation uh, and visual input. Um, 
so this uh, looks like this, and uh, as the question that was posed this morning, indeed, there are actually quite some random events that were happening. Uh, also, some bugs like the gel for some reason. So we had that more in the in the spring. We had some of those insects around the head. It's yeah, it was not the subject that smelled, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, and uh, it, the parkour was something like this. But there were actually cars and people uh, along the road. But also that was. Yeah, more or less random. So we just couldn't control it, and I didn't want to control it because, yeah, it was just let's see what this gives, and then we could follow up. Um, some technical details, but I'm not sure that's that much of interest. But uh, we used the mobile uh, smarting system, and but an important thing is that it has a gyroscope in the back of the head. So unlike the previous publications, we were able to look a bit at the head motion. Uh, during our recordings uh, that especially makes sense during the real condition where you actually bike. And then we spent some time on uh, getting rid of some of the unwanted uh, artifacts, uh, activity like the EUG and, and the eye blinks. Um, so the results, just uh, the most interesting one uh, given this talk is that there was a slight decrease when you are moving from sitting completely still to actually uh, pedaling and uh, this is depicted in a lower classification accuracy and a uh, slightly diminished P300. And in the real, real biking condition, where you actually move, uh, this effect was even bigger. Um, so this posed, again, interesting questions. Um, so we tried to split this uh, in a degree to the level of motion by the gyroscope, because there are certain trials, for example, where the subject maybe was moving his head more, that might indicate that there's something going on, that he was looking away or he was making a turn. Um, but we couldn't find a clear um, link between the, those uh, uh, between those signals. And on the other hand, uh, with some uh, extensive artifact removal and correction techniques, um, it seemed fairly decent uh, what we uh, found, that it was not just a noise as already also posed by, by the previous uh, um, papers. So that was a very nice thing to see. And um, as uh, um, Klaus also mentioned, it's nice uh, if people would replicate uh, your study, and that's what more or less happened uh, the year after. Uh, Joanna Scanlon um, did a similar study with biking outside with a slightly with a slightly different uh, setup, but very similar in, in processing and interpretation. And that was very nice um, because that actually strengthened even more the, the belief that already was going on in the field. But that leaves then the big question, uh, why is uh, is it that we are less um, uh, good in the task when you're actually biking freely around or walking? Uh, because it could be many things. It could be that you have to bike. Uh, you should not fall. Uh, it is because you see very different things. You have different visual input. And um, uh, following the literature, uh, it's interesting. But then I recently became very interested. Uh, and that paper uh, was also already mentioned by Klaus, um, by Julian Reiser, which showed uh, that there is also a link with the complexity of the motor task. And already biking by itself is, is more complex than just sitting on a, on a stationary bike. So that's a very nice um, study that could could relate to, to our findings as well. And um, one that will, I was told, uh, be released soon. Um, but I saw a presentation on it. It's very interesting and it's very related. It's it, uh, by Simon Ladus, which we'll talk tomorrow, actually. Um, I found uh, and stated that the visual flow and uh, the feeling that you are in motion also contributes uh, to this effect of having less at the uh, cognitive um, abilities to do the task at hand. So th that's for me like a, a very nice thing because for four years I was wondering what this effect would be in, in our study. And um, so you might think the case is closed, um, but that's not it because as you've heard before, uh, the task at hand uh, is a quite an... Uh, not so nice one with the beeps, and th that still didn't really appeal to me. So in that quest, uh, I came across a very new, rather newer field um, that is called the auditory attention detection. 
and that is a uh, concern with how we focus our attention on natural speech in scenarios where maybe more people talk or with different types of sounds and that's actually much more realistic for the for the subject and um, one of the experts in this field is also sitting in the room that's Boyana and she will give a talk about this tomorrow so I'll only shortly mention some things that that, I, that we found very interesting and hopefully it doesn't overlap too much so the idea is that if two people were talking at the same time and you were about to listen it is actually nicely shown that with EEG, you could derive a, a fairly basic model to find out to which of the speakers the subject is attending to. And um, we extended the basic approach to be in a, in a real time online way so that we could provide feedback to the user. So it's like a closed loop system. And um, this paradigm makes me so happy because it's one of the few um, paradigms I came across in my whole study that um, uh, have, to my opinion, a very strong use case uh, and that I think will be clear also tomorrow and it's also a bit about the hearables that uh, um, Stefan talked this morning and I think Martin will also talk about that tomorrow. And um, one of these things uh, while doing these studies, uh, and it, ha it has come across but not explicitly this morning, um, what I always find fascinating is uh, that between subjects there is a large variation and that's not new, that's not in the mobile field, that's in the whole neuroscience field and that's probably because we're humans and it's just very, in I'm very intrigued by that because why, if, if the technique would be perfect you will still find good and bad subjects, well they're not bad but they, they think differently. So that was a bit the, the idea behind this to, to get an actual realistic paradigm record at home at people and try to do this in a longitudinal study. So we need a lot of sessions, usually they do this on one day but the idea was to do this um, on eight <coughs> days and for that you need a lot of stimuli because they need to do this task a, a lot of times, it should not be the same so we made a, a, lo a lot of hours of new stimuli and um, yeah, it actually happened, that's the proof. And um, just a short thing about this, uh, there are only two subjects, uh, that's of course the limitation. Um, nevertheless, it, it might hint that uh, the SF that received some neurofeedback might increase more over time uh, compared to the control. But because there is uh, not enough data to support it, I, I don't want to claim anything. What's interesting on the other hand is that there seems to be quite a a link between the the day and the, a correlation between the two subjects that might hint that actually the task was not that some days it was more difficult than others to do this for the subjects because you see them synchronically move up and down and um, that's uh, just made me realize that it's always very difficult uh, to, to, to do these type of experiments because they're all the mobile factors but even attached to that you have the human factor that also you know, maybe some stories are more interesting maybe the emotions are very different and, and the motivation was mentioned this morning also shortly in a study even the personality by Arnaud in a study those things can influence also these results so it's just very difficult so and this was then in a in a, in a study at, uh, at home uh, at the people's home, that was nice, but then still, um, is this the real life? I, I don't think so, because they do tend to get out of the house a couple of times and those studies are still not done. Also, also we didn't do this with a realistic paradigm, so that would for me be like the real cool next thing. And um, another thing is that our studies so far have been with these type of caps, uh, with a laptop or a smartphone. But yeah, also such a cap uh, feels quite like, you know, the traditional swimming cap that's already mentioned. So indeed, what would be natural just because this was already all mentioned, it's clear that ear EEG has a high potential, whether it's in the ear or around the ear like the secrets. And um, it's just that I agree very much with what um, Klaus said, that it's maybe becoming much more application specific to, to what you want to achieve with the hardware. And then uh, you've seen all these pictures here with these statues. It's, that's also real, at least uh, we, we got to try a bit. Um, and, and 
as you can see, the only thing missing is the sort, and then it's uh, it's really marked. Uh, yeah, and this is just another example. Uh, I didn't. I just did some pilot recordings, um, but I don't want to interpret it too much, or, or uh, because I need to get more experience with the with the device. And I think also tomorrow or later today we'll hear much more about this. Um, but it just shows that there are still advances made, and that's nice, I think. And um, with that, I more or less want to conclude because I'm a bit over time. <laughs> Thank you.